This is just a little section about how strange water is. You know, water is essential for life, which is one of the reasons that when they're looking for life in outer space, they're looking for water. Um, it is the most common and important liquid on Earth, essential for life. So name some liquids. Gasoline. Coffee. Coffee's, coffee's actually a solution, isn't it? Mm -hmm. What's the liquid in the solution? Water. Water. Most of the liquid things that we can think of are actually aqueous solutions, right? So gasoline, um, vegetable oil is another liquid that is not water. Um, ethanol, uh, various alcohols. But there's very few things that we run across in our everyday lives that are liquids that are not aqueous solutions. Almost all of them involve water. And one of the things that makes water strange is that um, it's a liquid at room temperature, but the molar mass is, is so small, um, most substances would be a solid at room temperature. And that's due to hydrogen. It also has a very high specific heat capacity, you know, roughly four times most other substances. And so that gives it the ability to moderate climates. And we talked about that looking at the difference between Fresno and San Francisco. The other weird thing about water is that it expands upon freezing. And someone asked me, why does it do that? And I didn't think to go look at this diagram, but now I thought of it way back to the beginning of this lecture, this guy. So when water freezes, all of the water molecules line up, they take on a crystalline structure. And they're actually taking up more space this way than when they are in the liquid state. So they're spreading out and getting organized. And so water, liquid water is more dense than solid water. That's very unusual. Most solids are more dense than their liquids. And that has a lot of implications. One of those is that um, when plants freeze, um, they're not the same, right? So here's a head of lettuce, and this is a head of lettuce that was in that part of the refrigerator that's too cold. Right. So that, that corner always freezes everything. We found a bag of, of salad. It was just like solid. Dang, can't eat that. Because what happens to these cells? The cells in the lettuce in the plant have water in them, right? And when it freezes, what happens to the water? It expands and breaks the cell wall. Right? So it's destroying most, if not all, of the cells. And so you thaw it out, and it's just not the same anymore. It's just not the same. There are certain frogs that can um, can survive like a, a winter. They can freeze, but they actually have their own type of antifreeze in their cells, and so the the water in their cells doesn't actually freeze. Um, yeah, the other thing that's interesting about that is, so I grew up in Minnesota where lakes freeze in the winter. Um, you can go ice skating on them. They used to lay train tracks and run the railroad across frozen lakes. So if ice was more dense than water, as the ice froze, it would sink to the bottom of the lake and the lake would freeze from the bottom up, and it would freeze solid, mm -hmm. and it would kill all the fish and other living things in there. But instead, the ice floats, and so, you know, down at the bottom of the lake, when you, when you go down into the earth, the temperature is moderated by the earth, and it, 
take a deep tunnel, it might be like 55 degrees down there, but it's not gonna get freezing cold like it does at the surface. It's also not gonna get terribly hot. So if you've ever been in a cave, they're kind of the same temperature all the time. So the bottom of the lake is warmer and it's cold at the top where the cold air is. And so it freezes up there and because it's less dense, it doesn't sink, it floats at the top and forms this thick protective layer which protects the rest of the water from the cold and allows the, uh, the fish and things to live down there just fine. So there'd be no fishing in Minnesota if uh, ice was more dense. The other thing you have to watch out for though is um, the, the power of that freezing expansion is incredible. So in Minnesota, people have to be concerned about their pipes freezing. So, you know, if your heat goes out, then there's a chance that your pipes will freeze. Mm -hmm. You've got these big metal pipes, right? If the water freezes solid in them, it's gonna split the pipes. They'll break open and then you get a flood, right? Um, something you're more likely to see is if you stick um, a beverage in the freezer, right? you stick a, a unopened bottle of water leave it long enough, it's going to freeze solid, it's going to break the bottle. Right? Can of soda, stick it in there, it's going to, it's going to kind of explode eventually. So if you want to freeze liquids, like if you want to freeze some water, you want to leave some space in there for the expansion. And ideally you want to use a container that has straight up and down sides so that as it expands it can just kind of grow up. If it's tapered, Sometimes it'll kind of get stuck and can still mess up your container. So just some life experience there. <laughs> this is a graph. We saw a graph similar to this earlier. Here we're looking at the boiling point versus the period. And so this is a group, group four elements and group five and group seven and group six. And we see this general trend that the boiling point increases as the molar mass of the substance increases. And we can explain that through dispersion forces. The dispersion forces are stronger in larger molecules because the electron cloud is more polarizable. It's, it's flabby, right? And it can get out of shape. So those induced dipoles can happen better. So that explains this trend. But then there's these three guys that are just like totally breaking the trend, right? And um, for these, these guys are polar. Um, this one, well, actually all, all three of these are polar, which is why their boiling points are higher than um, the group four, which are nonpolar. But still, what's going on with that? What's that other force? Hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding. Remember hydrogen bonding, ET phone home? If you have fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen bonded to hydrogen, you have that extra strong force. So this one, oops, wrong thing. This one has nitrogen and hydrogen bonds, hydrogen fluorine bond, hydrogen oxygen bond. And so the, the boiling point goes way up because of the stronger intermolecular forces. I'm not gonna test you on this part about water pollution, but I think it's good to have a basic understanding of the types of water pollution. So obviously we know that we need to have clean water to be able to survive. Does that mean we need to have absolutely pure water? No, no. That would be like distilled water um, and actually drinking distilled water on a long-term basis would not be good for you because there are minerals and things in the regular water that your body needs. But we can get contamination of the water there's two types, um, biological contaminants and chemical contaminants. So the biological contaminants are microorganisms. Um, 
and those typically come from human or animal waste products and they'll get into the, the water source um, by being dumped inappropriately or you know, you've got a cow pasture near a stream, it rains and stuff from the cow poop runs down into the stream and so that's why, you know, when you're out in the wilderness, it's, it's not a good idea to just drink any water that you see. It might look great, it might taste great, but it could be contaminated, um, especially if there's cows around. So those sorts of uh, microorganisms call, cause all kinds of diseases and have killed a lot of people. Dysentery. You ever played the uh, Oregon Trail? Yep. <laughs> Somebody always ends up dying from dysentery. Mm -hmm. but, you know, we can laugh about it now. It wasn't funny at all. So, <laughs> so how do you, how you get rid of a biological contamination? Well, that's relatively easy. You can boil the water. That'll kill most of, most of the things. Or you can treat it chemically with something like bleach. I think iodine can also be used. That will kill the, the microorganisms in there. How do you get the bleach out? Well, you don't use too much bleach. The other thing about bleach is if you let it sit, the bleach will be destroyed. So that's why you have to keep adding bleach to a, a swimming pool, adding the chlorine, because the sun degrades it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't, no, don't, 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 don't drink bleach. Please don't do that. Um, chemical contaminants are just really uh, mostly from humans, but there are, there are water sources that are naturally contaminated with chemicals. Um, but most of this type of contamination comes from industrial and household dumping or runoff from fertilizer and pesticide use. So most of these substances are not volatile, meaning they don't evaporate easily. And because they're not alive, you can't kill them to destroy them. So boiling the water does not take care of chemical contaminants. If you boiled the water extensively, you know, boiled a bunch of it off, you'd actually be concentrating the, the chemicals. And so, so that's not so good. So, you know, getting rid of chemicals is, is trickier. You have to do various types of filtering. 